the Chamberlain Observatory uh, is in University Park and is owned by the University of Denver. Inside is a 20-inch refractor telescope which saw first light in 1894. Professor Herbert Howe envisioned it, supervised its building, but real estate mogul Humphrey Chamberlain came up with the $50,000, so it's named after him. Herbert Howe was a smart guy, got a degree in math at age 16 from the University of Chicago, moved later to Denver for the fine, healthy mountain air we used to have here. The University of Denver had no large telescope, so he went about building this one. He also wrote a popular book on astronomy in 1896, which explained much about the daily operations of the observatory. The Chamberlain Telescope was designed uh, for a very traditional kind of astronomy, sometimes called positional astronomy, to visually measure the exact locations of celestial objects and plot their orbits. Howe went to great lengths to build a truly accurate observatory. For starters, the telescope sits on a large stone pillar for stability. Streets were jogged in the area to prevent someone from running a horse real fast down the road and causing vibration. Denver skies were of course darker then and there were no other nearby buildings except Howe's home. Of course, today Denver is too light polluted for serious astronomy and our nearest dark site is over an hour's drive away. Now you have to know the sidereal or star time to know where the Earth is pointed and star time gives you the position of the rotation of the Earth relative to the stars and you need this to know where the stars are. Without knowing the exact sidereal time, you could not compute the position or right ascension of the celestial object. Chamberlain has two accurate clocks in it, one for sidereal time and one for local solar time. Both were attached through the wall to the stone pillar to prevent vibrations from altering the, the speed at which they ran. Now, as you know, Solar time is our position relative to the sun, not the stars. It's about four minutes a day longer than sidereal time because the Earth has to rotate four more minutes each day to point to the sun because of its movement around the sun. So now, how did you set the clock? You set it by using the Transit Meridian Telescope on which you could determine the moment that known stars cross the meridian, that is the line that's straight north and south. Sort of like, uh, oh look, Betelgeuse is at the meridian. That means it's five hours, 55 minutes sidereal time. Uh, it was a very accurate little transit telescope and it sits, of course, on its own stone pillar. To set the time accurately, they had a chart recorder with tick marks from the clock which had a pool of mercury in a little cup, and then when the, the pendulum made contacts with that, it make a tick mark in the chart recorder. When the star crossed the meridian, the astronomer would press a telegraph key near the transit meridian and also make a mark. They could then tell if the clock were running fast or slow. Now, they didn't actually reset the clocks mechanically. They just kept a running tally of the correction factors. How did have some 1896 advice for keeping time at home. Um, women, he felt, tended to neglect their timepieces, whereas men fiddled with them much too often and reset them and just messed everything up. When designing the building, Howe put the transit room in the east so it would be cooler at the end of the day and thus more accurate. The clock room had interior walls and double windows to keep it at a more even temperature. Now back in 1896, for Howe, the astronomer was always a he, and a rather special breed of man with an excellent brain and fantastic nervous system control. Of course, it wasn't all that great a job. Basically, you stayed up all night in an unheated observatory plotting the positions of things, 
and during the day you did mathematical calculations by hand. Let's look more closely at the telescope, the real centerpiece of the observatory. It was a beauty. The fifth largest refractor in the United States when it was built had a very high quality mount and it was quite accurate. It was well balanced. It was moved by hand cranks and it still is moved by hand cranks uh, during open houses and tours. Here is a picture of the mount up a little bit closer. It had very fine gearing and it had little engraved um, markings on the gears and there was a periscope like tubes with mirrors that allowed you to look up and see the engraved scale so you could tell exactly where the telescope was pointed. The lens was a very high quality achromatic doublet that is two lenses back to back to help control chromatic aberration. Professor Howe also built a very advanced micrometer called the Bruce micrometer because of course Catherine Bruce of New York City donated the money. With it, Howe could measure the location and size of non-stellar objects with great precision using the crosshairs in the eyepiece. Howe discovered many nebular objects and cataloged their right ascension and declination as shown in this table. He also published solutions to the orbits of comets and greatly increased the precision of Halley's Comet's orbit through his detailed observations. In addition, he was a surveyor, as many old-time astronomers were, and he was the one who first established the mile-high marker on the Colorado State uh, Capitol. So he's responsible in a way for everyone knowing that Denver is a mile high. However, Howe was very traditional, and he missed, he kind of missed the astronomy revolution at the end of the century. His interest shifted from positional astronomy to astrophysics. The new astronomers wanted to know what these celestial objects were, not just where they were and how they moved. Now here are, here are seven things that Hal missed that make him an old time instead of a new time astronomer. Uh, he was a visual astronomer and first of all he showed little interest in photography which was up and coming and was allowing even more accurate measurements. He had little interest in spectroscopy and how to identify an object's composition and speed of travel from us through its spectra. As you know, objects moving away have a red shift. Their spectra is shifted towards the red. Refractors work great for visual work, but reflectors worked better for photography, especially at that time, and can be made much larger than refractors. Uh, just as his telescope was finished in 1894, reflectors started to take over, and of course, all large modern telescopes are reflectors. Denver was an okay location, but it wasn't great. By 1890, Harvard was building observatories in really dark sites, and of course, most modern large telescopes are in remote locations or in outer space. And computer analysis. By 1891, Harvard was shipping photographic plates of spectra back to Cambridge for, ana for analysis by analysts called computers at the time. This method foreshadowed the modern method where astronomers don't actually look through their telescopes. The images are on digital sensors and sent to their offices over the internet for analysis. Oh, women astronomers. For how astronomers were men. But by Howe's time, some women astronomers were headed to much greater fame than Howe would ever see. Like Henrietta Leavitt, who figured out the relationship between brightness and the period for certain variable stars. Uh, Howe me measured very precisely, but with little unifying theory. He was a measurement guy. So we kind of miss linking his observations to something larger, uh, unlike, say, Hubble who uh, used Levitt's data on the distance of uh, variable stars and the redshifts in spectrographs to find that things farther away from us were moving faster. And he published this very famous graph, which quickly led people to, under to understand that at some point, everything probably started at one place. And that was the genesis of the Big Bang Theory, the core concept of modern cosmology. But nonetheless, Howe built stunningly a stunningly good 
old school visual astron observatory that even today gives very satisfying views of the planets and the brighter objects. And of course, the nice thing is you can actually come and look through the telescope. The Denver Astronomical Society hosts public nights and open houses, and you can stop by, uh, line up, and take a look through one of the finest visual telescopes still off operating, and it's really great fun. Uh, have a good night.